Exploring Comets. This is Rita Carl, Director of Education at Challenger Center for Space Science Education. Today's guest is Dr. Alan Stern, and our subject is comets. Dr. Stern is a planetary scientist, a member of the Challenger Center Board, and the former Associate Administrator of NASA's Science Mission Directorate. He is the Principal Investigator of the New Horizons Mission to Pluto. Dr. Stern has recorded a popular series of space science podcasts for Challenger Center. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Stern. We have some questions for you today about comets. Can you explain to us what comets are made of and where they come from? Well, sure I can. You know, comets are one of the uh, most valuable scientific objects in the solar system, or kinds of objects, because they tell us so much about the origin of the planet. Comets are typically a mile or a few miles across, made of rock and ice, and, and they come from the deep outer solar system where they've been frozen for over four billion years since the formation of the planets. Can you tell us the difference between a long period and a short period comet? Well, that's a great question. We really, in answering that question, have to answer two ways. First, the difference in their orbits is that a short period comet will typically come from a closer region of the outer solar system called the Kuiper Belt, and the long period comets come from much, much further away, 100 times further away than Pluto, in a region called the Oort Cloud. But how the comets actually vary, how the short and long period comets differ in terms of their composition and structure is still unknown to us because we haven't collected enough information to really determine that. So we can only distinguish them by their orbit types and thus their names. Why are some comets visible to us here on Earth in the night sky? I remember Hale-Bopp and Hayakutake. Both were visible in the night sky in years past, but many comets are not. Right. Well, that depends on a couple of things. First, how active the comet is, and usually that relates to its size, and also how close it comes to the Earth. And Hale-Bopp was very visible in the sky because it was a really large comet more than a hundred times the active area than a typical comet. And that made it much brighter. Yakutake came much closer to the Earth than typically, and that helped it appear to be brighter in the sky. So it depends on both these factors, and some years we have a bright comet, and other years we don't. Hale-Bopp had a very short tail, and Hayakutake had a very long tail. Why do some comets have long tails and short tails, and, and why do some have two tails? Those are great questions. The length of a comet's tail depends upon conditions of the sun and the solar weather at any given time and how active the comet is and also how the comet's pointed relative to the Earth because sometimes we see the tail broadside and sometimes it's heavily foreshortened because we're sort of looking down the barrel or the axis of the tail. You asked why some comets have two tails. Actually, most comets have two tails. As I said, comets are made of both ice and dust and one tail called dust tail is created from that dust and another tail is created from the ionization of gases produced from the comet's ices which produces a different tail and so the two tails relate to the two major components of the comet's composition the dust and the ice if you see a comet at night Will you see it moving in the night sky? We know it's moving in its orbit, and the tail is away from the sun. But do you see it moving when you look up and see a comet? Well, not usually. You know, if you stare at it real hard, uh, even through a telescope, it would be hard to distinguish that it's moving against the stars unless you take pictures like time-lapse over a period of several hours. Then you could easily determine direction of motion, but it won't move quickly through the night sky, and so if you just look up, it appears to be stationary in the sky. Is it true that scientists think that a comet was what killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago? And if so, how do they know? Well, many scientists believe that the trigger event for the climate catastrophe that killed the dinosaurs and many other species 65 million years ago it was the impact of a comet onto the Earth that cast a great amount of material into the Earth's atmosphere and caused the Earth to heat up. The evidence for this is in rock layers that are 65 million years old that are enriched in iridium, which comes from comets and other objects in space. 
and also evidence for an actual crater that's been dated on the Earth. It's exactly this age. Is it true that comets may have brought water to the Earth, Moon, and other planets? Well, that's true. In fact, uh, since comets are made of ices, primarily water ice and dust, and we know that they impact the worlds of the solar system, including the Earth, they definitely import water. And because we also know that the Earth and other planets were born very hot from the energy of all those impacts early on, we have to explain how water, which would have evaporated on a hot Earth, later came to be on the Earth. And since comets and asteroids have water and impact the Earth, we conclude that they may have been the most important source of water onto the Earth. Can you tell us about some of the most important NASA missions in recent times that have traveled to a comet, Stardust and Deep Impact? What did they discover about comets that we didn't know before? Well, NASA and the European Space Agency, along with the Japanese Space Agency, have all sent missions to comets to explore them. Because of such a great variety of comets, we would like to send very many missions and sample the variety of these objects. Stardust and Deep Impact are two examples of these missions. Stardust actually returned a sample of dust grains from the tail of a comet, and Deep Impact actually impacted the surface of a comet to give us a uh, crater, which is sort of a window into the comet's interior. Stardust taught us a lot about the composition of comets, where the material in comets came from. And Deep Impact has revealed information about the structure and also about the composition of comets. And both those spacecraft are now going on to explore their second comet, which will occur in 2010 and 2011. Overall, what have comets that we've explored and, and observed tell us about the formation of the solar system? You mentioned that at the beginning of our interview. Well, you know, because comets have been stored in this deep freeze in the deep outer solar system, they're very well-preserved samples of the original material out of which the planets were born. And that's their primary value, is their ability to tell us about the composition of the material out of which the planets were born. How do astronomers find new comets? New comets pop up all the time, and each year somewhere between a handful and perhaps a couple dozen comets are discovered. They're typically discovered by amateurs, amateur astronomers, with telescopes who scan the sky every night looking just for comets. And typically one or two are discovered every month and given a designation once their orbit is determined. That's how we find new comets and have an opportunity to learn new things about them. Thank you so much for joining us today. One of our signature Challenger Center missions in memory of the 51L crew was designed around their mission to Comet Halley. In our Challenger Center missions, we take students on a mission to a comet. This was an interesting and important interview for those students and those teachers who are going to be coming to a Challenger Learning Center. So thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Stern has completed many other podcasts with us on exciting topics in space science. For more information about Challenger Center, to leave a comment about our podcasts, or listen to more podcasts, visit podcasts.challenger.org. For more information about Challenger Center programs and lesson plans, visit www.challenger.org. This is Rita Carl, Director of Education at Challenger Center for Space Science Education, signing off. 